Well, Jen, thank you very much. Thank you to you and thank you to the Peabody Institute for this another great opportunity to talk about history, my, one of my passions. It's nice to see everybody. I hope you're staying warm and we've really locked out regarding the snow the last 24 hours. Again, my name is Anthony Guerrero and um, I was a former instructor of American history adjunct at Salem State for 11 years as a senior visiting instructor of American history. I also have two degrees in history from Salem State and then UMass. And I've spoken to you in the past about Thomas Jefferson, Tony Canigliaro. Um, if someone can, if you could just put your, yourself on mute, thank you. And um, Michael, I think you get up, yep, there you go. And talking about all different types of topics in history. So tonight we're gonna to talk about the Civilian Conservation Corps, which was created through the New Deal in the Franklin Delano Roosevelt administration. So looking at this first screen, what does that number three billion say to you? Well, to me, it says that's one hell of a lot of trees. And that's what, that's what the story is. It's about hope. Now, during the time of the civilian conservation creation, this is really a time of political rest. This is the great during the Great Depression. And it's the closest time in American history that some American historians felt that the free market capitalism system was totally dead. That maybe a different form of government, maybe a communist form of government was the way to go. You had presidential candidates from the Communist Party, the Socialist Party, naturally Democrat and Republican, the Prohibition Party, the Liberty Party, the Farmer Labor Party, and the Liberal Party, because things were just not getting better. And government was not seen as the solution at this time. Climate change, something we're very familiar with now. Mother Nature was kicking back. And in, think about this, in 1933, we did not have the science or know how, how to fix it. Strong winds had whipped, stripped the topsoil from the drought affected farms in the Midwest causing the dust bowl. And today, look what we're dealing with today. The 100 year storms now seems to happen yearly. We're dealing with sea level rise. And your question is, have we learned anything? Economic uncertainty. 1933 was considered the worst year of the Great Depression. Unemployment peaked at 25.2%. There's just approximately about one in four people who were unemployed. And un this unemployment touched everyone. And where was one to go for assistance? Every institution, the banks, education, medicine, and the government didn't seem to have the answers. And no one had any faith. Americans did not have any faith in these, arena, these arenas, especially government. And banks were failing weekly. And how do, how do you support your family? How do you pay your mortgage if you have no money coming in? And we know we've gone through a difficult time the last couple of years and there's a lot of similarities here. And when we go back to that year, 1933, fewer Americans were born in 1933 on a per capita basis than any other, than any other period in American history. 1933, think about that. 1933 is when Kraft Foods introduces Miracle Whip as a cheaper alternative to mayonnaise. It's also the same year that Hitler becomes Chan Chancellor of Germany and opens the first concentration camp. You have this massive crash and it's an economic calamity, it's an environmental calamity. And there are multiple economic reasons economic recessions in this country since its founding. Yet the Great Depression, which was from 1929 to technically 1938, was the largest with unemployment remaining in double digits until World War II. In the stock market, and we watch the stock market today and we get those daily reports, the stock market was down 90%. 90%, there goes your life savings. So you have the stock market crash on the one hand, and then you have the Dust Bowl on the other. So the barren soil from the Midwest 
this seems to fly away. And you have these two seismic events happening at the same time. And there is no constructed response to either one, to either one. And historians will disagree as what to, could be the different, you know, the causes of the Great Depression. But here's some of the ideas. High tariffs and war debts, stock market crash and financial pick, panic, agriculture, industry, the farm crisis, overproduction, unequal distribution of wealth. The banks really began to fall, fail in 1930. And with those failures, people just lost their life savings. And, and those banks, there was no federal insurance at that point. Right now, you have federal insurance, up, you know, starting at 5,000, I think, for your bank. Then it was no federal insurance for banks back then. And American people were angry. And they just felt that the government needed the change. They needed to do something. And you have these large unemployment lines, the creations of soup kitchens, Hoover bills, these shacks where people who lost their homes were living in. And the old slogan, brother, can you spare a dime? And, you know, the job is so important, you know, and this goes back to how do you identify yourself? If we think about it, we spend most of our lives working. So that is a major part of our identity, our psyche. Sure, you know, that our ethnic backgrounds, our political leanings, and re religious ideologies are all characters, factors. But it's the work identity that I think is the largest part. And what happens when that identity is gone? stripped from your being. Your work identity is how you define yourself through your engagement with various aspects of your work, such as your occupation, work roles, and organization. It's your work identity. The Dust Bowl was the first of several storms that began late in 1933, blowing the barren topsoil and causing extreme erosion and damage, and here's some of the elements, fire, climate change, erosion, and poor farming techniques. There was no scientific approach to maintaining the land at this time. And that's kind of something we're encountering today. And that continues, and I'm gonna say this throughout this presentation, begs the question, have we learned anything? Causes? Well, from 1925 to 1930, land, land on the cultivation quadrupled, automation with poor farming techniques encouraged erosion. During this time, over 2.5 million Americans were forced to leave the Great Plains because they could no, no longer live off the land. And the Dust Bowl represents Kansas, Colorado, the Oklahoma pan, Panhandle, Texas, and New Mexico. And think about that land just blowing away. And where would they blow off, blow off to? To California, to the Northeast. It was no longer livable land. But there was one person, the right time at the right place, and that's FDR, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. And FDR saw the effects of climate change in his own home state of New York, where he, he had a green thumb. And you know, his wife would his his wife would always say that Donald FDR, who had polio, as you know, polio gave him the patience to deal with both the Great Depression and Hitler. Think about that. Two major items right off the bat that he had to deal with. And FDR always believed that there were no problems simply solutions. What can the government do when it seems like it's broken? And that's a great question because they had no faith in the executive branch, particularly under Herbert Hoover. Hoover who came into the presidency riding high and very well thought of 
were very successful under both the Harding and Coolidge administrations, but seemed to have no solution in dealing with the problems of the Great Depression. Roosevelt came in with his second Bill of Rights, that every American has a right to a job, inadequate wage and decent living, a decent home, medical care, economic protection during sickening, accident, cold or age, and a good education. It's something that we hear on the newscast and airwaves every day today. And he makes a general promise that to Americans that happy days are here again. He had incredible confidence in himself and he had confidence and belief in the American people. In Roosevelt, the man, It was an interesting character. And he had a life-changing event with polio. And he used that experience to lead us through the Great Depression and into World War II. And this is the man who only had hope. He always believed that he would walk again. And he used that platform of hope to inspire Americans to suffer and succeed through the Great Depression and then lead us to victory in World War II. And why is hope so important? Because once you choose hope, anything's possible. And think, of, think about his inaugural address. This generation of Americans has a rendezvous with destiny. I pledge you, I pledge myself a new deal for an American people. And these diff days of difficulty, we Americans everywhere must and shall choose the path of social justice, the path of faith, the path of hope, and the path of love toward our fellow man. And think about we, what we as Americans, particularly the world, but Americans have gone through the recent pandemic and the economic fluctuations of the last three years. And those who stood still and did nothing, and those who said, we can get through this together and providing hope. That's why hope is so, so important. So we know that Roosevelt in his first hundred days, he was ending the, the ongoing issue of the crisis, the Great Depression. So he has all this work going, um, going through. And some these are some of the agencies that he creates, the CCC, the Emergency Conservation Work, Federal Emergency Relief Administration, the Works Projects Administration, the Works Progress Administration, Public Works, Federal Administration for Public Works, um, all these things to address unemployment. And you have the Federal Writers Project, the Theater Project, the Federal Music Project, the Federal Art Project, the Historical Records Project, TVA, the Rural Electrification Administration. And he took and looked at what was out there, he and his administration, and he breathed new life into it. And think about what the Federal Writers Project has produced for us that we have in our archives that had not been done before, that we have that rich history. The Negro Theater Project, the Federal Music Project, the Art Project. And you can go in buildings in Boston and elsewhere to take a look what that art project has supported. But the CCC, the Civilian Conservation Corps, of all the alphabet agencies that were created during the Roosevelt administration, this is the one that had such a long effect nationally. Who qualified for the CCC? Well, the qualifications for consideration was you had to be unskilled, unemployed men between the ages of 18 and 25. And World War I veterans were also accepted because they were young men at this time. They were probably in the 20s, maybe early 30s. 10% of the workforce to be African-American. Men would sign up for six months minimum. The War Department clothed and trained them for two weeks. And the Department of Agriculture designed and managed the specific work assignment. So the CCC enrolled these men. And these men primarily came from families on government assistance. Men enlisted for a minimum of six months. All recruits had to be healthy and were expected to be able to perform hard labor. And African-Americans were placed in de facto segregated camps, although administrators 
some say denied that practice. And, and this was really important because in 1930s, only about 30% of teenagers graduated from high school. And the families back then were a lot larger than they are today. I mean, my dad, who was born in 1933, was, was a member of six kids. And there are many stories of, of when male children reached a certain age, their parents would kick them out of their homes because they couldn't feed them or take care of them because there were others to take care of. And a lot of these would be hobos, you know, and they'd be going from state to state, riding the trains, trying to um, find some work. But now you can see the graduations rates and this really leads up to 2000. And by creating, and this is the brilliance of FDR, by creating the CCC, you're jumpstarting the economy with a living wage. This money gets circulated back into the community and it slowly brings back the economy. Okay, they get a monthly wage of 30 bucks, 25 went home and $5 went to the worker. So now parents had money in the bank and they could pay off their mortgage, buy groceries, et cetera. And think about the value of a dollar back then. So this worker who would have $5 in their pocket for the entire month, they'd, they'd be sustained. Very well. And, and through the course of its nine years in operation, three million young men took part in the CCC, which provided them with excuse me, shelter, clothing, and food, together with the $30 wage for a month. I mean, this was jump-starting the community. And by starting the local economy, you're boosting the economy. And you need supplies for the camp, so you need tents. And you need clothing, you need gasoline and kerosene and uniforms and foods and tires and tools and light bulbs, et cetera. So these camps that are being set up throughout the states need supplies. So now you have Main Street slowly coming back to life because we, the CCC, by putting this money locally is going to help boost that local economy. It's the trickle down economics. You have the local economy, home savings, wages finally, through the federal work program. Through the federal work program, that money is getting back into the hands of society. And what kind of jobs did the CCC do? And they built water storage basins, roadways, and ranger facilities, reseeded grazing lands, cleared and maintained roads, built picnic areas, animal shelters, fire, wildfire control measures, re wildlife refugee and overlooks, fish rearing facilities. And what did they say? These men finally had a job for a lot of them it's the first time in their life they ever had three square meals a day. There was a guy that I had seen, that I studied. He said that he had, he woke up, he had milk and warm cornbread in the morning and water and cold cornbread at night. That's all he had to eat. This is the first time a lot of these young men had three square meals a day and they got healthy and they got big and they were eating well and they gave valuable skills and training in education, that was all offered to them. So they would work during the day and at nighttime, you could take a class. You could learn about mechanics. You could learn how to type. You could learn about budgeting, architecture, math, English, so forth and so on. So now you have a trained workforce. But you know, in politics and in life, there's gonna be criticism. So, you know, this is the largest, largest, Assembly of Americans at peacetime, and they call them Mr. Roosevelt's tree army. These were non-union jobs. So wages were made stacked. It was run by the United States Army. And some people said that the army reminded them of Mussolini's black shirts. And some were saying, is this socialism? And, you know, 
They relocated the men to work in sites established the camps where they worked and mounted projects that would benefit both them in the nation. Think about that, what the CCC did. There's a great book by H.W. Brands is a teacher at the University of Texas called Trade It, I don't think you can see it, Trade It to His Class, but I wanna read just one piece from the book, okay? For Roosevelt, this is FDR, the mission of the Conservation Corps has much to do with conserving human resources as with saving America's forests. Think about that. As much to do with conserving human resources. He concluded his story of Virginia camps with the comment that he had hoped that CC camps all over the country were inspiring, inspiring as these. All you have to do is look at these boys themselves and see that the camps are a success. He gave them a job. He gave them a job. And if you do some studying of that period of time, and I remember I, when I was doing this as a student and teacher of history, I'd be looking at these images of the, of the 1930s and on the wall, for a lot of families, they might be like a religious picture. Maybe it's the Last Supper. And then there'd be a picture of President Roosevelt, usually ripped out of a magazine or a uh, newspaper article. And you hear it time and time again, why did you like FDR? And the person says, he gave me a job. He gave me a job. And when you take a look at the camps all throughout this country, the total cost of subsisting the Civilian Conservation Corps from April 15th until October 31st, 1993, 1930 amounts to about $17 million, or $57.56 $57 per man for six months, practically all of which was either directly or indirectly going to assist in the recovery of agriculture in farmers. Think about that. And you're taking a look at Black Thursday, 1929, and how the recovery slowly starts in 30. Well, the Hoover administration did take some minor actions, but not enough to solve the problem, the ongoing economic problem. Within his first 100 days in office, Roosevelt and staff produced what is called the alphabet soup agencies. And we just talked about that. The TVA, the WPA, the Rural Electrification Administration, just, just to name a few. And during the Great Depression, President Roosevelt's CCC put 3 million, 3 million young men to work across the country. Living camps across all 48 states, including the territories of Alaska, Hawaii, Puerto Rico, and the Virgin Islands. The men of the CCC created camping areas and hiking trails in state and national parks, built roads, fought forest fires, constructed dams, and planted almost 3 billion trees, all for a dollar a day. All for a dollar a day. Two new national parks. These two well-known national parks were both built almost entirely by the CCC labor. The Great Smoky Mountains, straddling the border of North Carolina, Tennessee, and the 600-acre Big Bend National Park in Texas. In addition to that, the CCC helped create a total of 711 new state parks across the country. Now, we're from Massachusetts, at least most of us on this call. Look at Massachusetts. Look at all the camps in New England, okay? Now, this is an old map dating back from the first core area in 1940. So this represents New England, but you can see Massachusetts right there, okay? The CCC 1935 passes the half million, million mile, which was a pretty big deal. And Roosevelt loved being with them. He loved going to these camps and being with these young men. They were his pride and joy. He had a special place for the CCC in his heart. CCC in Massachusetts from 1933 to 1941, at its peak, there were about 51 camps in the state. Approximately 10,000 men were enrolled a year. And, if, and think about it. Think about the CCC. When it was first created in 1933. Now, 
Roosevelt got got uh, inaugurated in March, not like we do in January. Back then, it had been March. Within the first four months, his administration mobilized four two hundred and fifty thousand men to stop the CCC in four months, mobilizing 200, 250,000 men. Can we do that today? In Massachusetts, the main work accomplished was in tree planting, firefighting and tree and plant disease and insect control, although several recreation facilities were also built. Enrollment in Massachusetts exceeded 9, 000, over 99,000 men. An average of 28 camps a year were operated within the total financial obligation within the state of more than $45 million. The CCC ceased conservation work in 1942 as the beginning of, beginning of uh, World War II. And this is from a study by UMass Amherst. And here's just a list of some of the projects and the areas locally that they worked in. Shawshank State Forest, Otis State Forest, Mount Greylock, Lemis, Lemis State Forest, Irving, Beartown Forest, Brimfield State Forest, Chester State Forest, the Jaws of American Revolution, Harold Parker State Forest, which is near Topsville, Martha's Vineyard, Mohawk Trail, Oak Ham State Forest, Mouse Dandish down, down in the, near the Cape, Otter River State, Wendell State Forest, Willow, Willowbrook, Windsor, Scansfield, October Mount. These are all the areas that we go as citizens of this Commonwealth that we have enjoyed. I, my, my wife and I, my young son, we, we walked the long path of um, Harold Parker State Park, State Forest. And we see some of the remnants of some of the structures that the CCC built, but the road that we walk on, that everyone walks on, the path, the different pathways were cut and prepared by the CCC. Uptown State Forest, Nominated in 2013 for the National Register of Historic Places, located in Worcester County. Between 1935 and 1938, the CCC made many improvements to this forest as picnic areas, dams, roadways, and overlooks are built in. I'm from the North Shore. So I've been going to Breakout Reservation in Saugus since I was a little boy. So unbeknownst to me, the CCC has been part of my life since I was a young boy. Over the, over the course of six years, the CCC built roads and trails, planted trees and restored dams at the upper pond and lower pond. The efforts resulted in a return of wildlife that had become rare and break out, including beavers, fisher, fishers, coyotes, blue herons, and, all, and owls. And this is from a report in 19, between 19, 2015 and 2013. And this project was completed in 1941. And I have spent countless hours in my memories of being out here, being out in the fresh air, being in the woods, getting away from the craziness that is our daily lives. There's something to be said about that. And Roosevelt understood that. Roosevelt loved being in his gardens at his home in, in Hyde Park in New York. He and in Campobello up, up in Canada, he understood that. And these men were getting healthy now. They were doing hard work. They were out in the open, breathing in the fresh air, doing physical labor, which was good for, the, for their mind, their body, and their soul. Time travel to 1933 and visit the Conservation Corps at the Blue Hills Reservation. And and you know the CCC was just a huge success in the uh, Roosevelt administration. 194 total working camps, 94 national parks, 697 camps, and 88 state and local parks. And in the words of Holly Jolly, who was a World War II veteran, member of the CCC, he said, "You heal the land, you heal the man." You heal the land, you heal the man. But with all good things, something they always come to an end. And what killed the CCC? World War II. World War II was the effective death of the uh, CCC. 
And if you take a look here, these are the numbers for the uh, American personnel. We had a small armed forces after World War I. And then you could see that the numbers starting to increase. And when the War Department was running the CCC, you had a ready supply of men who were prepared to live a military life because they had been in the CCC. And these are the young men that fought in World War II. Canadian National Park. And this is from the webpage of the Canadian National Park and it's a tribute to the CCC. The benefits to the men in the land were many, but the ones who benefit the most are those who come after, the visitors of today and of future generation. They will walk the trails, camp under the stars, and shit in the shade of the trees. They are the most fortunate. They represent the tree army's greatest success. And think about it. Think about this. These men that worked for the CCC came, went to war and came back. It's their children that became the first environmentalists. They became the first environmentalists. And we today benefit from this great program. And what is the legacy of the New Deal in the 20th century? Ah, it's twofold. Now, we remember that Ronald Reagan, President Reagan, one of his early statements said, government is not the solution to our problem, government is the problem. Now, I've been in government all my professional life. I know how government works. I also know how government can be a challenge. So, but I'm not a, a great fan of this government. When government works in the eyes of the American people, we can do many great things. There have been many great successes in the fields of science, technology, in, uh, in social welfare. Some of the men and women who put man in the moon were educated by the GI Bill. The CCC would be the boilerplate for other usually successful federal programs as the Peace Corps, created under President Kennedy, and the America Corps, under President uh, Clinton. TFA, Teach for America, and a usually successful city year program. Another success story from the CCC is the US ski industry. We didn't have much of that. And so think about this. A man who had no use of his legs is the father of the American ski industry in this country. Think about that. They were the CCC were the ones that created the trails for skiing in New England, in Vermont, in Massachusetts, in New Hampshire. From 1945 to 1956, about 50% of the American veterans who served in World War II availed themselves uh, to one or more aspects of the GI Bill. Another 2.2 million veterans went to college, 3.5 million went to technical vocational school, and 700,000 took instruction in agriculture. The number of Americans who earned college degrees more than doubled before and after the war, from just 200,000 in 1940 to nearly a, a half a million in 1950. Think about that. And again, this comes back from Roosevelt because Roosevelt, was assistant secretary of the, of the Navy. And he saw all these soldiers, these veterans from World War II I, coming back and there was nothing for them. They didn't have an opportunity to go to school. They didn't have an opportunity to get trained. They didn't have the money to do it. So what he did was he put these soldiers in academia and kept the workforce as it is and slowly had that transition. The Social Security Act. Who was responsible for the elderly prior to the creation of Social Security? You were, a person's family. If Uncle Joe had no children and you were only his loving relative, he'd come and live with you. In the 20th century, 
people were living longer, but many people at this time were living in poverty. So this provided some form of income for older Americans and still into effect today. Conservation, what does it mean? This is, this is the battle. This is what we fight over all the time. No one wielded more power as president to the cause of preservation and conservation than, F, than uh, FDS cousin Theodore Roosevelt. When the story of the national government's part in wildlife protection is finally written, it will be found that while he was president, Theodore Roosevelt made a record in the field that is indeed enough to mean a reign illustrious. That's from Horn, uh, William Hornday, New York Zoological Park. Heal the land, heal the land, you heal the man. President Lincoln, in June of 1864, he signs a bill establishing Yosemite Valley as a pro protected wilderness area. He's the father of the national park system. Think about that. Abraham Lincoln, 1864. He's in the middle of a brutal civil war. But it's Lincoln who sees the beauty and the need to protect Yosemite Valley as a protected wilderness area. Other presidents are conservation presidents. Richard Nixon created the Environmental Protection Agency, passed the Marine Manimal Protection Act of 1972 and the Endangered Species Act of 1973. Jimmy Carter was the first president to really push for solar panels and use of solar energy and install solar panels on the White House. And Bill Clinton designated over 19 national monuments during his presidency. Woodrow Wilson created the National Park Service as a new bureau under the Department of Interior. So you have great men with great vision. But we still deal with this issue of conservation today. Clear cutting, filthy water, sea level rise, soil erosion, droughts, the climate of Earth that has taken a drastic turn in the last 30 years. Climate change is real. And you, you beg the question, have we learned anything? One person that took climate change very seriously was Queen Elizabeth II. And I'm, I'm not shilling here for the crown, but what a wonderful legacy from Queen Elizabeth. The queen has always said that she was fascinated with trees since she was a little girl. So this initiative invites people from across the United Kingdom to plant a tree for her jubilee that was just two years ago. Everyone from individuals to youth groups, villages, cities, counties, schools, and corporations were all encouraged to play their part to enhance our environment by planting trees from October, 2021, the start of the tree planting season, to the end of the Jubilee year in 2022. What a wonderful legacy. Great success story. Holly, Holly, Holly Jolie, a great World War II veteran, Mars Hill College professor and historian, a young, a young CCC enrollee died um, in 2020 at the age of 100 years old, World War II veteran. And he said the CCC is one of the great, great achievements of any government at any time. Vincent Jimenez, Mexican-American, that's him on the far right, first row. He started out as a field worker cleaning mesquite trees before becoming a chief clerk. In the camps, he made sure that there was enough food supplies and he wrote letters for those who didn't know how to write. And he's a Mexican-American. And there was a lot of racism back then too. And he said, he learned a lot, I learned a whole lot about the need for cooperating with each other. He went to fought World War II, went on the GI Bill, and ended up working in the Johnson administration. Walter Matthau, Raymond Burr, Stan Musial, Hall of Fame baseball player for St. Louis Cardinals, Chuck Yeager, the, the greatest test pilot of all time. All were part of the CCC. Before there were celebrities, 
they all worked for the CCC. And many co consider the CCC a smashing success. In its nine years of existence, the CCC put nearly, again, three million men to work. In that it was put together so fast, it was unprecedented and no easy task. So the CCC, and I wanna read this introduction from another book, the Civilian Conservation Corps, the history of the New Deal's famous jobs program during the Great Depression, okay? They can just be it with me. In less than eight years, the CCC planted billions of trees, built thousands of cabins and other rustic buildings, cleared thousands of acres of land and created thousands of miles of walking and hiking trails. It gave them work to do and taught them skills that could be used in the workplace, but it also taught them to appreciate and care for the land they worked and lived on, inspiring an unprecedented level of admiration for the environment. A generation later, these men would tell their children stories of their work on the land, inspiring an explosion of interest in the environment in the 1960s, a passion that continues to this day. In 1930s dollars, the cost of the CCC is probably about 50. And the CCC, by the time it concluded in 41, was responsible for over half the reforestation, public and private, done in the nation's history. And it became the model for future conservation programs. More than 100 present day core programs operate at local and state and national levels, engaging young adults and community service. That's one hell of a legacy. And, be, and before I open it to uh, questions, Jen, if you want to pop back on, you know, Jen, Jennifer had mentioned that I've spoken to you before, and I have. My first talk was Jefferson the Foodie about Pro Thomas Jefferson's role in, um, in the American cuisine. We've talked about Tony Canigliaro, the great Red Sox player that was whose uh, career was tragically cut short, he did come back. We've talked about Ted Williams and his quest for perfection. We've talked about Mo Bird, um, the spy who was a catcher for the Boston Red Sox. And last year, uh, we talked about the Christmas miracle. And the one thread that links all those stories together with this one is the idea of hope. Hope is so important. Hope is so important. When we talk about the Christmas truce of World War I in 1914, it's the belief that this war is gonna get over, regardless of who wins, and I'm gonna see my family again. And for that one brief moment, they celebrate Christmas together, the Germans and the Belgians and the French. Tony Cagliaro always believed he would come back. Mo Berg fought for a different, a higher cause. Ted Williams believed that he would be the greatest ball hitter that all, of all time, and he did achieve that. And Thomas Jefferson, Thomas Jefferson had an undying hope in the future. Jefferson would always say that I prefer the dreams of the future than the memories of the past. And he said that to his old friend, John Adams, who was a skeptic of human nature, but Jefferson wasn't. So that is the common thread. And that's something that we need today, don't we? We've been through a lot the last couple of years. I'm not trying to be on a soapbox here, but it's nice to hear a story of hope and you have to believe in it. So Jennifer, thank you very much again, everyone. Thank you for listening. And I'll open it up for questions if you'd like. Thanks, that was great. Um, Pat has a question. Were there any similar programs for young women? Not at that time. At that time, no. And then you had a lot of young, and you had a lot of women, remember, during World War II that went into the workforce uh, because there was a need in the military industries. But there was no such program at that point. The funny thing is that in a lot of these camps, there were Americans in these small towns <clears throat> that felt that all these young men coming into these small towns would be a danger to their daughters and their sisters and so forth and so on. So it's an, e an interesting economy during that period of time. But you had a lot, you had women, uh, not for the CCC, but the other programs, the uh, Federal Writers Program, uh, the Negro Theater Project. So other programs, <clears throat> there were a lot of women involved with, particularly the Federal Writers Program and the music program. 
were inv involved with that. Was there an age range? What was yeah, the maximum be, age for? for well, they, had to be, they had to be 18 to 25. Mm -hmm. And as I said earlier, uh, uh, FDR did allow World War I veterans to participate. Right. Now, in 1933, these World War I veterans were young men. They're probably in their late 20s, early 30s, and they needed a, they needed a job. Did they try to revive it after the war, or did it just spin off into these? Other, it, other... It, just, it just it just basically died. I mean, it is you know the the military was which was running this with the Agri Department of Agriculture just transferred these men into the military machine that won World War II. And then you had the money that was then you had the money over time that was you know delivered to the Department of Interior to support the national parks. And then you have, like we have here, DCI, the Department of Conservation and Recreation, the former MTC, that was flush with money, maintaining these small state parks and open spaces. Great. If anybody wants to unmute and ask a question, that's fine too. You don't have to put it in the chat. We've got a small group tonight. Um, I don't know. I, those are my questions. <laughs> Do you know if there are any films? Um, yes, so there's a great- that Include this in it, in them? Yes, so I, I'm not aware of any films. I'm aware of a documentary. Mm -hmm. And PBS did a documentary on the 1930s, probably about 25 years ago. And it's the Great Depression and um, the stock market crash, the Hoover Dam, and this is one of them. It's called the CCC. It's a great documentary. It's a very uplifting documentary. Every time I've shown it to my students, uh, when I watch it, I feel like a million bucks after it because it just, it, it, it's just so wonderful. Like you're just realizing all this great work these men, these men did, and you don't really realize that you're the beneficiary of it. You know, I, I, I just stumbled across it at breakout. I, you know, I, I go there and I see a small moss covered monument and says built by the ccc and that really piqued my interest and um i'm i'm being like most a lot of the young kids from the north shore i've been going there all my life it's great i think a lot of us are going to look out for those things now because absolutely i certainly haven't seen them but i, I will now <laughs> and, you know when I, when I when i go by and i walk through brush or i walk through a small little bridge or i see a dam somewhere at any of these national parks or state forests in the back of my mind, I'm saying the CCC built this. You know, they cleaned it, they cleared it. This, you know, and I'm, if this is, you know, this is 80 plus years, this is almost 90 years, 90 years later, actually it is 90 years, right? Um, 90 years later and, you know, I'm, I'm a, you know, what am I, the third generation benefiting from this? Fourth generation betting from it, so very lucky. Does Massachusetts have a CCC museum? So from my understanding, that's a great question. So the MDC keeps a record of documents regarding to the CCC. So the DCR, the Division of Conservation and Re uh, Recreation is the um, depository of all this record keeping for the CCC. I'm not aware, I mean, the only other place I think it would have it could be the Commonwealth Museum on uh, Columbia Point but in my research, it's the it's the DCR that has that re maintains the records. And I and I really think that to what I just said, I think that the forest that I had listed and these um, small reservations, they maintain their own small record of it. I know at Breakout, if you go into the Regents' cabin, there's a couple of pictures and newspaper articles about the CCC. Um, in them. So I think that those individual areas might uh, maintain some record as well. You may have some of the statues. Are there any of the statues? Um, there is a, a particular CCC statue. Uh, Florida, for instance, has quite a few of them. And yeah. I, su I suspect you do in Massachusetts. I don't know. I haven't, you know what, I haven't been to all these places. Um, you know, a lot of them, which makes sense, is, is very rustic. But um, I haven't seen any statues. I've seen some uh, granite stones. 
mm-hmm. carved in or maybe with a bronze plaque dedicated to the CCC. I haven't seen a formal statue. I have seen some um, eagles, which would be designed representing that period of time from the 1930s. I don't, I don't know what the actual type of artwork that is, but it is very, uh, it resembles that type of era. That's great. Any last questions? We got a couple more minutes if you want to jump in. This was really terrific. I I know for, I for one was not that familiar with this program, so I'm really glad we had this and I got to learn about it. Thank you. I'm glad we're not talking about the Red Sox because I have no idea what's going to happen. <laughs> the system. Well, there'll be there'll be time for that. Yeah, there'll be plenty of time for that. My husband and I worked in the uh, CCC Museum for the state of Florida in Seabrook. Oh, great for about 14 winters. And uh, we had the great privilege of knowing a lot of the men who were the docents who had been in the CCC in the early years that we were there. That's and great. They, they had just the most positive attitude about the program and uh, so many wonderful stories to tell. As a matter of fact, they're probably the most po- positive group of people that I've ever met in my life. Isn't that, isn't that amazing? I mean, I thank you for sharing that. I mean, you, you have to think about, my, my father was born in 1933. So he lived during the Great Depression, but he was just a little boy during this period of time. But these men that we're talking about, you know, what did they have? They had nothing. I mean, everything, the rug was pulled out from them. And what you're saying is that they, they were positive. They lived through and survived the Great Depression. They fought in a world war. So it was one thing after another. And like I said, I mean, it's their children that became the environmentalists that this country, you know, we deal with today and we need. We had one man who, who characterized it as a vacation from poverty, <laughs> which was a very apt uh, description. Another one told the story about, he said there were seven young men in his family and the older boys ate their cereal cornflakes had just come out they ate it with forks yeah and why so the younger children could have milk on yeah. their cereal. very I mean, think, stories yeah and think about it i mean you know you keep hearing that this is the first time these young men had three squeal meals a day in the sandwiches they had, you know, they had never seen that much meat in a, in a sandwich in their lives and they they could eat as much as they wanted they didn't have that opportunity. I mean, they, they, they had a, to your point, they had a sacrifice for their siblings and their parents. So it's just, it's, it's, it's a heck of a story. Well, we really appreciate it. You told us some things that we did not know. Mm-hmm. And I think we're fairly knowledgeable about the CCC, but still uh, there were some things that you talked about there that yeah. I wasn't aware of. Well, thank you. I, I greatly appreciate that. I mean, that's that's my goal, right? And it's just more or less the topics that I've been talking about, really, they're my passion and the stuff that I love that's close to my heart. And the CCC, I think, is just, it just, it just shows you that government does work. And um, and thank you for sharing your stories. That's uh, that's great. I didn't know about the museum in, in, in Florida. So that's, thank you for sharing that. The government of Florida spent $300,000 back in the early 2000s to create this museum. There was already a collection of items there, which I cataloged over the years, but um, they really created it to tell the story beginning with the Depression. And where, where is it? What exa- where exactly is it? It's in central, Virginia, central um, Florida, oh. south of Orlando, and okay. in Sebring. You, May have heard of Sebring in relation to the race. Yeah. <laughs> okay, that's great. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. that that's good stuff. It's in a state park. <laughs> <laughs> very fitting. Right. <laughs> okay. Well, again, I want to thank everybody for uh, listening in tonight. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned something. That's the whole goal. Um, please stay well and stay warm and be careful. Um, and what I like to say is live long and prosper to everybody. <laughs> Jennifer, thank you is, again. And thank you to the Peabody Institute for giving me this opportunity to speak. Yep, We look forward to your next talk. You got it. Thank you. <laughs> thank Take you. care, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Have a good night. Bye-bye.